Thanks. It's, it's great to be back at, at Wheaton. Thanks, Steve, for the introduction, and Alexa, for your prayer, and Joy and Ben, wherever you are back here, thanks for leading us in that great time of worship. As I was uh, on campus yesterday and walking around, uh, I was walking past the Student Center building, and I remembered when I was a freshman here at Wheaton. I, I was walking past the uh, Student Center one afternoon, and someone comes out of the building that I know, and he says to me, Ken, do you know that it's the freshman chapel tomorrow? And I said, no, I, I, I didn't know that. I, I missed that. And he said, well, the committee has asked me to speak at the freshman chapel tomorrow, but I can't think of anything to say. Would you do me a favor and speak in my place? <laughs> yeah, I should have been laughing my head off. But spontaneously, we Japanese have a tough time saying no. I just said yes, kind of blurted it out. And then I felt these pangs of regret. <laughs> I'm, I'm back in my dorm room that night, sitting on the floor, thinking, I don't know what to say, and it's really too late to ask someone else, what do I do? I'm going to humiliate myself tomorrow. And I remembered this Scottish minister named Robert Murray McShane writing a letter to his niece who was in college, and he wrote something like this. I hear that you are excelling in your studies of the classics, Latin and French, but how is it going with your soul? So I just got up in chapel the next day, read the letter or part of the letter, took a deep breath, and asked this question. I asked when, I was asking it to me as much as anyone else, when we get to the end of our four years here, what, what good is it if we have excelled academically but have lost our soul? What good is it if we distinguish ourselves in some way in our studies but our, our soul is shriveled? Well, as I come back here to Wheaton, I want to I wanna ask that question to myself and to you again. When you get to the end of your four years here at Wheaton and you walk across this stage with your degree in hand, where do you want to be? You're going to have wanted to have studied in, in, in such a way that you have opportunities for good jobs and maybe grad school if you want to keep going to school. Uh, my, my goal was lower. I, my goal was to simply not flunk out of Wheaton. Seriously. My first day of class here, I was in a computer programming class, had no idea what was going on, was completely lost. I dropped out immediately of, of the class. <laughs> before I was going to get kicked out. At the end of your four years here, you will have wanted to have made some good friends. And some of you here are even more ambitious. You will have wanted to find your life partner. But at the end of your time here, where will you want to be with Jesus? Where will you want to be in your relationship with God as you prepare to launch into a career? Now, while you're here with all the academic demands and all the amazing extracurricular opportunities, for some of us, we'll, we'll have the temptation to put our friendship with Jesus on pause and think in the back of my mind, I'll get to that when I'm out of Wheaton and I'm a little less busy. But I'm telling you, for most of you, you're going to be just as busy when you finish Wheaton as you are now, if not more busy. When I finished Wheaton, as uh, Steve mentioned, I, I moved back to Tokyo, Japan, where I'm from originally, and I started working for the Sony Corporation, and I was what they called a 7-Eleven man, which meant that I left my apartment at 7 in the morning, didn't get home until after 11 at night, and if I was out socializing with some of my colleagues at a bar, I would be home even later. When I moved to Vancouver, which is now my home city, and became a pastor, I was pretty much just as busy. 
There was always a deadline that I was facing. Uh, There was always a sermon to write, someone in crisis. I felt like I was constantly treading water, just gasping for air. And then a friend of mine who graduated from Wheaton, a mentor as well, named Leighton Ford, a minister in North Carolina, called me up and asked me if I wanted to go on a pilgrimage to the holy places of Ireland with him. So I go, and uh, we visit some of the ancient monasteries of Ireland. And from the monks, I learn about this ancient rhythm that, that helped the monks experience God as alive and real, not only in their times of formal prayer, but as they are working in the fields, as they're studying in the library, as they're eating, as they're sleeping. And I was hungry to to know God as we were singing about earlier today in my everything, in every part of my life. And so this morning, I, I want to talk briefly about Daniel's rhythm, obviously not Daniel Brown's rhythm, but Daniel in the Bible's rhythm, about part of my own, and invite you to consider a life-giving rhythm for yourself here at Wheaton. So let me just take a moment to pray. Living God, um, as we prayed earlier, um, we ask that you would do something that only you can do. We pray that you would open up our heart and our ears to the voice and the reality of your spirit. May you speak to us, and not only speak to us, but come and live out your life in and through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the first people that we know of in the scriptures to live by an intentional rhythm is is Daniel. I believe that Esther was another. uh, When her people were in a time of potential crisis, she fasted. But but this morning, I want us to focus on Daniel's rhythm. You know, when Daniel was a teenager, your age, or maybe just a little bit younger, his his homeland was besieged by King Nebuchadnezzar's army, and and Daniel was, was forced to go to Babylon. He was enrolled at one of their best universities as a potential leader in that new land. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are forcibly transferred to the University of Tehran. It's not a temporary study abroad deal. It's not like uh, Wheaton in Iran. But it's a permanent change for you. You're cut off from your friends, your family, your culture, your language. You're you're under the leadership of some supreme guy over there who has absolute power. How do you feel? Well, if you can imagine that, you get a little sense as to what Daniel felt when he was deported to Babylon, cut off from family, friends, language, culture. He's he's immersed in studies of science and history and literature and philosophy from a completely pagan point of view. He's being tutored in astrology, sorcery, magic, subjects that are considered idolatrous in his homeland of Israel. He's even given a new name, Belshazzar, a symbol of Babylon's desire to totally reprogram him. And later in life, when it's a capital offense to even pray to the living God, to any God except the king of Babylon, how does Daniel fare? Does his relationship with God die? No, it becomes more alive than ever before. In fact, Daniel works with such wisdom and such courage and, and he lives with such beauty and mystery that people point to Daniel. And the only way they can explain him is to say, there is a guy in whom the spirit of the gods is living. Wow. What's, what's the best compliment that you can get here in a place like Wheaton? I, I, I don't know what, what that would be now. Uh, 
for someone to say, maybe one of your professors to say, you're brilliant, or you know, you're a great musician or athlete, or you, you, you got sharp style, or you're a hipster, or well, I don't know what it is. You tell me later. You tell me later. The greatest compliment that you can receive is for someone to look at you and say, the only way that I can explain Claire or Jeremy or whoever is by saying that the spirit of the living God must live in her or him. How does Daniel become a person whose friendship with God not only survives in Babylon, but actually thrives? Daniel doesn't leave it to chance. He has a plan. He has a rhythm to receive the life of God. In Daniel 6.10, we read that even when it was a capital offense to do so, Daniel returned to his room three times a day, got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to the living God. And in a way that that it's hard to logically explain when Daniel is on his knees, giving thanks, seeking the living God, the very spirit of the living God is coming into Daniel and animating him to become the kind of person who displays God's wisdom, beauty, and courage powerfully in his world. And people who live with such mystery and beauty and power that the only explanation for it is that the living, loving God lives inside them. They have a rhythm. They have some kind of habit that opens them up to the life of God so that they, in turn, can channel that to other people around them. It might be as simple as setting a chime on their watch to remind them on the hour, no matter what they're doing, to... to, pay attention to God and to thank God or to seek God's help. Uh, People who embody the life of God have a rhythm, have what the ancient monks called a rule of life. Now, don't let the word rule scare you. When the monks use the term rule, they are simply using the word rule to refer to its root word, which means trellis. And as you know, if you've been to the Napa Valley, a trellis simply provides support for a grapevine so that the grapes are more exposed to the sun, so that the grapes can be guided in their growth. And a rule of life or a rhythm of life is simply a trellis that supports our friendship with God so that we are more exposed to the sunlight of God, so to speak and therefore produce more of the fruit of God's spirit in our lives, more of his love, joy, and peace. Now, our receiving the sunlight of God and and then experiencing the fruit of God's character in our life, his love, joy, peace, is primarily something God does. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So so God's producing fruit in us is primarily God's work, but you and I have a role to play. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works within you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. God's at work within you, changing your desires so that you want to do things that bring God's pleasure. Paul is saying, just go with it. Go with it. Or to paraphrase Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, someone planted the seed in your life, the seed of God's word. Someone else watered it. You, this is the paraphrase, can create a trellis, and God will make you grow. And I don't want you to think of having a trellis or some kind of life-giving rhythm as part of your practice as being just one more thing to do. No, this is something that will give you life. You know, I live on the coast and uh, in Vancouver, as I mentioned, and I love to sail. I love to sail, and I don't see sailing. This is what it looks like to sail in British Columbia. Any of you have been to British Columbia before to Canada? I don't know, quite a lot of you. It's, it's what it's like. 
And, you know, when someone invites me to go sailing with, I'm not thinking, oh, what an obligation. What a duty. Someone came into my office the other day and said, Ken, we're doing a fundraiser for a Christian camp. We're going to have an auction with fine wines. We want to auction a sailing trip with you on my yacht to raise money. I know you're really busy. You probably don't want to do this, but can you spare the time? I'm like, are you kidding? Are you kidding? (laughs) When I sail, I'm exposed to the sun. When it's sunny in Vancouver, which is just in the summer, Wind that refreshes me, I feel more alive. And so it is with my rhythm with God. My rhythm with God is is like a trellis that exposes me to the sunlight of God, making me feel alive, drawing me closer to the source of life, Jesus Christ. Let me talk briefly about my own very simple rhythm. My rhythm includes Sabbath. Uh, ideally a 24-hour period of time where I unplug and I don't do any work or anything related to work. I'm going to talk more about Sabbath tomorrow and what a gift it can be for us. So I'm not going to elaborate on that now. But I want to simply say that it's a far better way to live when you are working from rest rather than desperately resting from work where your starting point is rest, and then you work from rest rather than just you know, desperately needing to rest from work. But more on that tomorrow. Sabbath is a very important part of my, of my personal rhythm. Second, um, exercise is an important part of my rhythm. It doesn't feel like a have-to discipline for me, but again, something that is, that is life-giving. Uh, this morning, um, I, I took a little swim in, in, in the pool over here. Uh, yesterday when I came in, I... I, I took a little run uh, along the, um, the, the, you know, beside the train tracks. You know, you guys in the orange shirts that were passing me, I was like the slow guy that you were passing. But, but every morning I either swim or bike or, or, or run or do something. It's part of my rhythm. Your rhythm may look different. Dr. James Poshaka, a researcher at the University of Rhode Island, has discovered that exercise is a kind of keystone habit that can trigger other changes in our life. For example, for many people who exercise, they find that they eat better, that they're more productive in their work, that they tend to feel less stressed, more patient. And for some reason, people who exercise tend to use their credit cards less. Go figure. So for me, Sabbath, uh, exercise, and meditation is another part of my rhythm, of my trellis, of my rule of life. Now, I tend to be very uh, easily distracted. Uh, It feels like there are a thousand monkeys jumping around in my brain at any given time. And so at some point in the morning, I'll sit down somewhere, as I did this morning, and I'll just sit and still myself and breathe deeply. And because I'm so easily distracted, I'll use a simple word like Jesus or wait to help me focus on God and to savor his presence. I don't meditate for very long, maybe 10 minutes, but when I do, I feel more relaxed, more focused, more conscious of Jesus throughout the whole day. Uh, Meditation is part of my simple rhythm. And you know, I bet that some of you here think, oh, meditation... It's, that's such a waste of time. It seems so impractical. But according to Dr. Kelly McGonigal, a psychologist who teaches at Stanford, after here's the encouraging thing. Um, after just three accumulated hours of meditation, that's not three hours in one sitting, but it's like 10 minutes a day for like two or three weeks, people actually show signs of greater attentiveness and they exhibit more self-control. According to Dr. McGonagall, after just 11 accumulated hours of meditation, that is 10 minutes a day over two or three months, you can actually see that the neural networks in people's brains are starting to change. And and, and that part of the brain associated with focus and controlling our impulses is actually developing more neural connections. There's a guy named Andrew who's like me, very easily distracted. He's an engineer. 
and he was, he was practicing meditation 10 minutes a day, and he thought, I'm terrible at this. When I'm, when I'm trying to focus on my breath, all the thoughts leak in. I'm just, I'm, I'm just such a loser when it comes to meditation. I'm going to quit. But then Andrew, before quitting, looked back over the days when he had meditated, and this is what he noticed. He noticed that on the days he had meditated, when he was standing in line at the cafeteria to buy something, and he was trying to get into better health and be more watchful of his diet and stuff, when he was wanting to buy something deep fried and salty, on the days he meditated, he was more likely to make a healthy choice. He also looked back and he noticed that when there was something sarcastic about to drip off the end of his tongue and stab someone, on the days he meditated, he was more likely to hold his tongue. He also noticed that on the days he meditated, when he was distracted at work, which was quite a bit, he was more able to refocus on his work. This might not seem very spiritual, but if the goal, if the goal of our rhythm is God in our everything, then meeting God in our eating and in our just interacting with other people and in our studies, all of, all of these really matter. All of these really matter. And I want to say, because I know that quite a few of you are probably perfectionists, the goal is not to build a beautiful trellis. Someone else actually built this one for me. The goal is not to become a superstar at some kind of spiritual practice. The goal is to simply have a few habits, simple habits, that expose you to the sunlight of God, like a trellis. For me, like sailing. You know, when I'm sailing and I come back and I'm sitting in my um, kitchen with my wife at our, at our dining table, my wife will sometimes say, Ken, you are glowing and it's not like the sunburn <laughs> you just seem so refreshed that's the goal of the trellis of the rhythm to expose ourselves to the sunlight of god which produces in us god's love joy peace and who of us wouldn't want that now as uh, steve mentioned i've written a book recently called uh, god in my everything and in that book there is this image of this trellis and uh, different ideas of what might be part of our trellis. Uh, can you see the pointer here? Okay. So tomorrow we're going to talk about Sabbath. Look at that, that, that incredible gift. And then on Friday, we're going to talk about spiritual friendship, what that looks like. But there are other parts of, of the trellis that can support our life. We've got our, our sexual energy, which can lead to creativity and uh, extraordinary acts of generosity. That's, that's, that can be part of the trellis. Play. Uh, our play can actually support our friendship with God. Uh, things like justice. You know, a, a rule of life, a rhythm of life. A trellis isn't something we build just to support, you know, me and my relationship with God. But but ideally, it lifts us up so that not only are we nourished, but so, we, so that we have more life to offer the world. That's, that's the gift of, of the rhythm. Not long ago, my, my wife said to me, she said, Ken, you're the, you must be the happiest pastor I know. She doesn't know that many pastors, <laughs> And, uh, you know, some, some of you are pastor's kids, and you know that being a pastor is not necessarily an idyllic job, as some people uh, presume. But pastors regularly face people in crisis. They're, they're, they're often dealing with, with situations of social upheaval. And so to the extent that I experience joy, it's not because there is this absence of crisis or drama in my life. There's plenty of that. But if I experience joy at all, it's partly because I've got a great family, by God's grace, great friends, but it's also because I have this, this trellis that exposes me to the sunlight of God, that keeps me connected in my friendship with Jesus no matter what. It's such a gift. 
And my prayer for you, as your time here at Wheaton unfolds, is that you would know the joy that comes not so much from the absence of pain and drama in your life, because these things can refine us, open us up to God and ourselves like nothing else can. But I pray that you would know the joy that comes from the very real and alive presence of Jesus Christ in your life. And I pray that God would give you a rhythm, a rhythm so that you not only sense God's presence when you are formally praying or in chapel, but in your studies, in your basketball, in your music, in your eating, in your hanging out with friends, and in your service to the world. My prayer is that as your time here at Wheaton unfolds, that like Daniel and Esther, you would know God in your everything. In your everything. Let me offer this prayer a blessing as, uh, as, we, as we go. I may be from Japan, but I've been blessed by the Irish, so let me offer this Irish blessing to you as you go. Uh, sisters and brothers, uh, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind of the Spirit always be at your back. And may the sunshine of God always warm your face. May the strength of God pilot you. May the wisdom of God uphold you. May the power of the Holy Spirit sustain you. May Christ be on your right, and may Christ be on your left. May Christ be in front of you. May Christ be behind you. May Christ be under you. May Christ be above you. And may Christ be within you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.